Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Teresa Capellos. She is Associate Professor in Political Psychology at the University of Birmingham, Director for, or the, of the Institute for Conflict Cooperation and Security, Director for, for the MSc in Political Psychology of International Relations, and President of the International Society of Political Psychology, her research focuses on the effective, cognitive, and motivational determinants of political judgments, and today we're going to talk about that, and also a little bit about political radicalization and uh, some other topics. Let's see where we can get today. Perhaps we will <laughs> have a second talk. So, Dr. Capellos, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. It's a pleasure to be here, Carlo. Thank you for the invitation. So, tell us about some of what I mentioned in the introduction. What would you say are the most relevant aspects of human psychology for us to have a good understanding of political judgments and where they come from? This is a really good question to start our conversation, I think, because the, I, I was trying to think... Um, how to answer this and I think um, I'm going to go with a cheeky answer. The fact that uh, paying attention to psychology to understand political behavior is a really important crucial starting point. Very often when we try to um, understand or predict and dissipate how uh, humans be would behave, particularly in context of political decisions, we look at calculations of self-interest, we look at um, their ideological attachments, uh, their commitments to groups, um, to ideologies, to nations, and we try to make sense of what they will do or very often what they will not do in terms of understanding apathy, lack of political engagement, lack of political behavior, which has implications as well, based on these processes. Or very often we do the unthinkable of looking at demographic characteristics, just basically classifying people based on their socioeconomic status, um, their age, their gender, the country where they live, and we try to make general rules about how they will behave, leaving out the psychology behind these decisions. But human beings are psychological beings, so trying to understand anything that uh, relates to how they will act or how they will not act or whose actions they will choose to support or oppose is a fundamentally psychological process. And that's why looking at all aspects of human psychology or political psychology helps us understand political decision making. So I know it's a, it's a little bit of a cheeky way highlighting the fundamental value of psychological insight in being able to understand political behavior. But we would not be able to move much into the understanding component of behavior if we leave psychology out the same way would we would not be able to understand much of what human beings do if we don't look at their psyche which is one of the the main drivers of behind their decisions um, and they always interact with the environment so i would say that a healthy approach of um, of trying to understand um, how individuals engage with the political is paying attention to their psychology, either at the individual level, their group psychology, or psychology at the mass level, when we think about my psychology processes mm -hmm. and practices. Yeah. So let's get into some specific aspects of human psychology that act as determinants of political judgments that you do some work on. So starting with the effective ones, what are the effective aspects of human psychology that play an important role here? So when we, when we think about psychological decision making, we pay attention to mental processes that help us make sense of the world and affect or what so that your listeners don't get it confused. Emotions um, is one of the things that impacts um, the way we act. Now, this is, um, this is not so new in the field of political psychology, but it might be new for some political scientists and scholars from other disciplines paying attention to emotions, how people feel, to make sense of how they act. 
but in fact there is a lot of work in psychology proper and political psychology and cognitive neuroscience of most places that actually suggests that the way we think is um, is very much intertwined to the way we think and feel. Well, the way we think is linked to the way we feel and feeling and thinking go together. They are part and parcel of how we make decisions. So although we try to isolate them when we study them, and we can talk about affect in a minute um, and how we study it, um, it is important although we introduce these binaries of feeling and thinking because it helps us understand it a little better um, in the lab or in our studies when we measure concepts, it is important for us to start uh, from the point of recognizing that these are our attempts to make sense of how we make decisions and feeling and thinking and practices intertwined. Um, so despite our best efforts to isolate it, um, I, in the real world, the way it plays out, it's always together as two sides of one coin that you have to rotate uh, in a 3D dimension to be able to see it all better. And if you stick, if you fixate on one side, you miss the other side. So that it's always important for us to kind of recognize our blind spots if we are advocates of, of one type of mental process, feeling versus thinking. Um, so just to page back a little, there has been bias in social sciences um, in, the, in, in, in the last, be, with the behavioral, I guess, uh, revolution, trying to paying so much attention to how people act without looking at the determinants of these actions. And then slowly with what we call the affective turn um, in social psychology and political psychology, we started paying attention to affect. What is affect? Um, so again, I went around a long way to answer your very direct question. When we think about affect, we think about a mental process that helps us um, get a sense of, of how people feel um, phenomena around them, um, right, the environment. So the same way cognition is another mental process that involves processing information and making sense of stimuli um, cognitively. Um, as a mental process, affect is a system of capacities that we have, a skill sets, and processes that involve how we feel um, about the world. Some of that feeling is conscious feeling, we recognize it, and some other feeling is happening automatically. We don't even have time to think about it and recognize it. It just happens and pushes us um, to do things. So a simple way to think of emotion is like a force, a force that helps us navigate the world. Um, it's, it's very often what drives us to do things. Um, there's a lot of theories on and emotions, proper and political emotions, that will debate um, to what extent thinking drives our feelings or feelings drive our thinking. But um, the classic definition of emotions originating from the term emovere, which means to move, gives a really good um, short understanding of what emotions do to us. They move us to do things. And um, they have a developmental function as well. Um, in the real world, when you're anxious, you are, uh, when you feel anxiety, that can have a self-preservation value as well because you can hide, you can run away. If there is a threat in the environment, somebody chasing you, that can save your life. Um, so being responsive quickly as, as a body, as a human being, based on your emotions, can have benefits to your survival. Um, the same way if you want to reach to get something, right, being uh, positively motivated and engaging can help you get to where you want before somebody else gets it. So that has beneficial function as well. So it, that's a long way to go from the world of the jungles or uh, the deserts and how uh, human beings survived to the political world of today. But evolution gives us benefits, makes us who we are, and emotions is um, one of these skill set that we have that helps us respond to the environment. Most animals have it as well. We are not unique in that. So, but we use it. We use it every time we make political choices, either to orient ourselves towards objects that we find motivationally um, consistent to what we want, so things we, as we say, like, 
or pull away from things that are motivationally inconsistent to our needs and goals and aims. So we, we attract um, things that cause frustration and how we react to that, things that uh, add to our pleasure and desire and how we react to that. So emotions are fundamental. Um, affect as a system of um, mental processes that coordinates emotions and sentiments and our feelings and other flavors of affectivity um, is important for us to to keep in mind, to, to at least try to understand. Mm -hmm. uh, and a second type of determinants are the cognitive ones. Uh, what would you have to say about that? And I know that in a bit we will also uh, try to intertwine the affective, the cognitive, and then also the motivational. But, the, the, but tell us now about the cognitive. So this is the, if, if, as we said before, there are sides to one coin, that's the other side, another mental process that involves how we think, how we process information, how we make sense of the world around us. And a lot of political psychology work and psychology proper work has looked at how we make sense of the world from a cognitive side. So there's all this work on stereotypes, how we take mental shortcuts when we perceive others, and they're automatic, they're very quick. Um, they help us make decisions, heuristics, in other words, um, that allow us as cognitive shortcuts to not go through this whole process of thinking about something, but have quick solutions on, on how to get there. Some of them are automatic as well, um, and they are conditioned over time. Some of them require more deliberative processing, careful calculating of information. There's models of completion that also look at how how we store information. So studies that are looking at um, the, the systems in our heads, what we call our cognitive schemas, um, and how they are structured and how they are um, comprised of uh, concepts um, and nodes, links between the concepts that are activated so these activation models help us understand how quickly we can recall information when we see a relevant stimulus, how quick, how possible it is to retrieve information from long-term memory to, to, to use it for future decision-making. Um, these models also look at how we group information together. So how do we make sense of the world in systems, in schemas that are meaningful, consistent, and, and structured in a way? Um, as part of these studies that are looking at cognition also, we see what we forget, what we fail to see, or our prejudices, if I want to say that, what we hold on to. Um, the selective exposure theory, um, which is a, a big theory in psychology and in media studies and in political psychology, is fundamentally based on premises of, of cognitive studies that say that we tend to expose ourselves to information that is cognitively consistent uh, to what we already uh, believe. So that is a model that tries to explain how we orient towards new information about reality based on our appreciation, our cognition, our thoughts about our current state of our reality. So Understanding cognition has important implications for trying to make sense of how people um, perceive the world. Learning uh, is also part of these studies that are looking at cognition. What kind of learning do we have? How do we learn? Who do we learn from? What uh, bits of information are we likely to retain longer? Um, and in there is, as you said, where cognition and emotion interact because we find that information always has an affective tag, as we call it, like a, a label on it. And that affective tag very often is processed cognitively through the same system mentally, uh, much faster than the information bit that is linked to. So we feel before we think about the same uh, exact object and that conditions how we think, because if emotions come first, they can create an environment in which conditions come and, and, and rest. So all of this goes together in one big bundle that when we try to make sense of it academically, we make our 
uh, classifications and categorizations and try to, to, to uh, authoritatively say that we're standing one side versus the other. But at, at, on the whole, they are very intertwined. And in politics, it is important for us to recognize that and not keep our blinders on thinking that it's only one or the other. Mm -hmm. I mean, even with what we know from uh, modern scientific psychology, it doesn't make sense at all to separate uh, emotions from, uh, let's say, reason or cognition <laughs> in general, right? As has been traditional in Western thinking, at least in some domains among philosophers, for example, to separate reason from emotion. I mean, it doesn't make sense, right? We try to separate it so we can study it more effectively, because if you try to, mm -hmm. you know, it's like almost putting things in a microscope while recognizing that there is a leaf, there is a whole picture there, but you are narrowing it down to particular cell structures. So it's the same thing for any study of human activity, where you narrow it down, but the, I guess the bet is not to lose the forest for the tree and recognize, as you say, that although we separate it to study it, we cannot separate it to live it, that we live it together as one thing. The more we are aware and conscious of how our cognitive processes interact with our affective processes, or to some extent, you know, how, how they go together, uh, the more I think we become aware of what drives us, um, which brings you, I think, to connection, the motivations, the things that matter to us, that, um, that very often determine how we feel and how we think about the environment. Mm -hmm. But uh, how are motivations connected to the affective and cognitive aspects of psychology? I think definitely, right? Because to be motivated, uh, motivation also requires some deep understanding and a value system that allows you to order things preferentially. So motivation requires affect, it requires cognition, it cannot sit aside this um, unless we say that we are motivated to survive, okay? So that, that is kind of like a drive theory. Um, which has merits and value in itself, because after all, we are bodies, we are human beings above and beyond anything. So there is this motivation towards life, towards preservation of life that will uh, determine our goals. But there are other motivations as well that are very much linked to the way we think about the world, about our aspirations. Um, so for instance, altruism, that's an important motivational force behind the things that we do that will shift the way we think and will shift the way we feel. And so if you think of motivations, think of them as systems of our uh, values of the things that we consider important. Um, and once something occupies, something is placed in our motivations, so once is recognized and, and we know that we value something, that has the potential to orient our decisions um, politically, but also in our individual lives. Mm -hmm. So with this sort of uh, psychological introduction to uh, political thinking, let's get into a more specific topic, political radicalization. So what is it? How, how would you define it from a political psychology point of view? Okay, so this is a really interesting, very timely topic and highly debated as well, because it brings together not just political psychological insights, but studies on terrorism deal with political radicalization, studies on extremism, um, political philosophy, political theory have examined this phenomenon. So from a political psychological perspective, and perhaps with the narrow, the narrow approach that um, each academic researcher can only adopt. Um, when I think of political radicalization and think of, of something that is, is a, well, sometimes can be a movement, can be an ideology, can be an orientation. In my work, I deal with um, radicalism as a, as a political orientation, and then I can explain what that is. Um, that is motivated by the desire to overturn the old towards something new. Um, 
So it's linked to this urgent desire for uprooting, changing um, what is now. Radicaliz radicalization, radicalism doesn't have a very good relationship with the present. It doesn't appreciate the present and that's why it wants to change it. And the way it would like to change it is not slowly, progressively, that's how it differs from progressivism, but it wants to change it urgently now, yesterday if possible, um, and wants to outroot it, so completely reform it. So it's a desire for urgent reform. And radicalization at its extreme can lead to, can, can be associated with extremism, it could be associated with terrorism, but it's not only the desire to change things forward that can be violent, it's also the desire to change things backwards. So radicalization can have its counterpart, reactionism, that can be equally uh, uncomfortable with the present, equally desiring change, sometimes urgent, sometimes violent change, or endorsing means that are not mainstream. Um, accepted as mainstream political practices, but reactionism wants to go back, whereas radicalism wants to go forward. Radicalization is the process for some, many of my colleagues um, who study how we get there, can be a process by which individuals disengage from mainstream politics or from the desire to um, appreciate the present or change it progressively, slowly, to more urgent, violent, abrupt forms of political change and the means that would get there. So the, there's a stream of research that looks at the process. There's a stream of research that looks at the ideologies. So there is work on right-wing radicalism, left-wing radicalism, and there's work more on the political psychology of that that looks at it as, as, a, as an orientation, as a desire, as a motivation rather than an ideological space attached to the left or the right. And this is, this is where I am, but I recognize that, you know, that there's much broader ways you can understand radicalization, radicalism, and its consequences, and also its psychological origin. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Uh, yes, it helps. But uh, since we started with the framework of looking at the affective, the cognitive, and the motivational, uh, Tell us, for example, about, if we know something about it, the emotions that might play a role in political radicalization. This is a really heavy topic, a very important topic and, and relatively understudied. We, we are making steps um, in research to understand this a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So we recognize, as, as we discussed before, the need to pay attention to the emotions, the, the affective element of radicalization. Um, to the extent that you are a scholar, let's say, looking at political extremism and you want to see how people get there, you might be studying the affective, emotional, pull and push forces that will get you to attach yourself to other radicalized groups or individuals. There it's very important to think a little bit about, to think about the types of emotions that help us form attachments. So these are the feelings of safety and uh, appreciation and value, right? These are the, the emotions that help us attach to things. And also look on the other side, what are the feelings that the emotions uh, feelings are they kind of like the, the our understandings of our emotions, right? So when they're recognized, they're feelings, but emotions don't always have to be um, conscious. Um, so th what are the emotions that contribute to disengagement, mm -hmm. pulling away from, staying away from something? And these could be feeling underappreciated, feeling hurt, um, um, feeling strong dislike, aversion towards something, or feeling very afraid from something, because if you're afraid of something, you wouldn't attach to it. So the frustration aggression hypothesis that put, pulls people away. So these push and pull factors that many of my colleagues look at when they try to understand political radicalism and they try to see them as systemic factors, right? What is the state doing, pulling you, pushing you away from mainstream politics or what are groups um, that are involved in radical acts do to pull you in, um, it is very, very important to focus on how the individual feels 
in that context, both as an individual, but also collectively, the emotions that connect us to groups or push us away from other groups. So feeling um, ignored, having a strong sense of grievance, feeling undermined, feeling envious uh, of what other people have, feeling ashamed for how others see us or see me in the individual and group level, are really important pull factors, push, push away, push away factors, whereas the pull factors are the they're usually the positive emotions that lead to att attachments, like mm -hmm. feeling proud, feeling valued, feeling safe. And when we study people that radicalize, um, after they had a time to, many of them de-radicalize, get out and reflect back to their experience. So when they have this critical encounter with their experience, they can tell us that they felt this way, that they were able to feel warm, feelings of safety um, and appreciation from the group that they attach to while they recognize feeling pushed away from mainstream politics. So addressing how people feel, not placating it, but recognizing it and taking steps to um, promote pro-social emotions and, and calm down or release antisocial emotions in a way that is constructive would be very helpful if we want to curb um, violent radicalization. Although, having said that, it is important to understand that radi ra being having radical desires is a way for progress as well. So it's not every generation's every generation is radical for itself, and it becomes conservative for the next radicalization, and sometimes reactionary when it's trying to hold on to what's already gone. So it's it's a human process to want to change things sometimes abruptly, and that can be a healthy thing. So um, I shouldn't be uh, seen or heard to say that uh, we need to control how people feel so that we can avert change, but we need to be able to understand it and make sense of it in order to understand how they engage with radical political acts. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about radicalization, but more generally, uh, where do political values come from? Ha! Huh. Political values, where they come from? They come from so many places. They come from, you mean, how do we end up with our values mm -hmm. yes. as individuals? Right. Okay, so first of all, they come from our immediate environment. Um, the main socialization agents of our family and our friends as we grow up, the place, the community in which we are embedded has values that we adopt very often, or sometimes values that we decide to run away from later on in life, but they definitely give us uh, a point of reference that we can then either attach to or uh, orient against. Um, so early socialization experiences, schools, um, important peer groups are very important, communities of contact. So for instance, for some people, religious associations and groups, sport communities, places where people spend time and where they interact with other people, they can give us our values. Um, and then we talk a little bit about political values, which are values that are um, promoted or instilled in us, depending on what you want to study, um, from the political groups that we associate with. So this could be political parties, could be leaders that we admire, that we look up to for their values, and then we uh, agree with them or not. Um, and systemic values that have to do with society and the way society operates. So um, then fundamental principles of democracy can be seen as values. So you can go from the very, very small to the very, very big in a system of values that help us get together. Um, one would say that these are the ones, the, the values of the principles by which we live by. And because we are social human beings, we share them and we like to be together with people that share the same values with us. Um, it doesn't mean um, that um, my values are better than yours, as, as long as we all agree to live in pro-social, with pro-social values, that means values that do not restrict you too much and give me uh, huge powers, that that can be calibrated. 
So we, we have studies that examine cross-culturally as well um, our values, like the World Value Survey is a fantastic um, database that contains measures of um, different values across societies across time. So that, that can um, give us valuable insights, valuable insights on, on how societies um, react to political phenomena and, and how they are likely to, I guess, progress in a way, towards which direction of change they will orient themselves towards back or towards the future. Um, with more tolerance towards anxiety and uncertainty or less tolerance, that's also very, very important. And it also helps us calibrate um, how we understand um, laws, uh, the making of new rules in society very often reflects values. Um, so there is always this connection between the values that we hold, the society that we live in, the values that this society and political system inspire, and the kind of citizens and individuals that we become within that context. It's an, it's an ongoing interaction between the individual, the group, and the social here. Mm -hmm. And how do we go from political values, however we develop them, to political uh, ideologies? So we have, we have what we call human values, basic values, and we have mm -hmm. political values. And they are not necessarily, well, well, that distinct, but the, the basic human values become the foundation for um, combinations, basically, of values that become political values. So how do, we, how do we go, how do we engage in our political reality to find some ideologies attractive? And how do some of the ideologies are able to define our values? It's really, really important to see this as a two-way uh, system of influence. Very often in our studies, we only study it one way, how the political system uh, generates values that we, uh, we adopt, or how we select political systems that are consistent with our values. But there's always an interaction. There's always, um, there's always an exchange there of information organically. Um, and that's why when we think about the political realities of populism, it's very, very important for us to study the values of individuals that support populist preferences, but also think about how populist environments, populist systems, um, can affect the values of the youth, which is the voters of tomorrow. I have a few of my students who are looking at this, actually visions of um, utopias that young people can imagine when these uh, young people, adolescents, who are not yet voters, but will be in a few years, have been raised in populist environments. What are their visions for politics? And you get some really um, interesting results there about what people can imagine is very much constrained by what they see. Uh, so that's, that's, that's why education is important. Anyway, going back to your question, values and political ideologies. In my work, um, I am trying to measure the values of individuals and how then that might help us understand their political preferences on the left and on the right. It used to be that we would think that people on the left have particular values and people on the right have different values. And that is not longer the case, at least in our empirical models. What we see is that people on the left hold values that you would traditionally um, understand as right-wing values, and people on the right sometimes are proposing proponents of values that you would think that are more uh, left-leaning. And this becomes a little bit confusing and, and, and creates a little bit of a debate about whether values are essentially ideological or they can be untangled or they can be studied aside of ideologies. I seem to find evidence that we need to consider values outside ideological attachments um, as instruments that can help us understand political preferences without necessarily holding them on the left-right continuum, which especially in the context of populist politics can be very fuzzy. So um, what we do find when we look at values is that people, core values, 
um, when people desire change more, they're more open towards adventure. So basic values and, and how they orient themselves, they're more open to um, to freedoms or free, free will, yeah, and more experimenting in their life. So they're more comfortable with change. In other words, they are more likely to seek political alternatives or political choices that um, that move towards radical positions. Whereas people who like values, uh, who who dislike change and they're more comfortable with things as they are or things as they were, which very often is an imagined way of how things are or could be, would orient themselves towards more reactionary political alternatives. And they can be both on the left and on the right because a reactionary political alternative can be promoted by a party that is left-leaning and also a party that is right-leaning. That's how I split, I distangle, if you want, um, the, the right and left political party um, labels from the options that people find palatable based on their orientations, uh, reactionary versus radical, and the, the space in between, which is occupied by progressive, retrogressive, and conservative, if you want to put it in a, in a continuum there, and how that attaches to some basic values that involve your desire for change, or your um, attachment to um, tradition and and the old ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. So there's one thing I think that we haven't talked about yet. Uh, whenever people talk about politics, we usually or many times we focus on the conflicting aspects of it the left versus the right the libertarians versus the authoritarians i mean the way people from different political poles differ but there are also the political tolerance right so what characterizes psychologically political tolerance we're dealing with very very difficult but very stimulating topics today um Tolerance. Okay, so tolerance always starts from a position of dislike. When you tolerate something, um, and it's important to clarify this, we tolerate things that we know that we don't like. Um, and it is a position that we take, a knowing position, so it's a conscious choice to allow things to exist while recognizing that you don't like them. You don't agree with them, you don't want them, but you allow them to be. That's what tolerance means. You to tolerate something fundamentally, you have to dislike it. Um, you cannot tolerate something you like, you just like it, right? So tolerate, tolerating starts from a position of a negative orientation towards something, but recognition of, no, of your, um, let's say, the lack of your um, ultimate power to kill it or do away with it. So giving permission for something to exist is tolerating something is the first step towards tackling your own narcissism because omnipotence and tolerance don't go together, right? Narcissists are intolerant because they are omnipotent or they think they are omnipotent. Anything they want is what goes and, and they should have and anything that they don't like should just disappear. Um, so tolerance and narcissism are two opposite concepts. They don't go together. And so bringing it, why am I going through narcissism for tolerance? Because in, in modern politics, when collective narcissism is a problem in our societies, is one of those, this phenomena that we have identified as rampant, um, tolerance suffers. Because when our narcissistic needs and desires uh, trump uh, our tolerance, cancel our tolerance, um, then that compromises our ability to recognize the other, to recognize the value of the other as in opposition to you, um, recognize the significance of the other to exist, and, 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 and also compromises your ability to deliberate, engage, interact, confront in some ways, um, whatever you are tolerant of but not liking. Um, so it is a challenge political tolerance to understand it. It's a really important uh, concept for our modern societies. 
we see it very often in terms of how we show tolerance towards um, groups that we dislike. But it's also very, very important for us to recognize that all of us are tolerant of some groups and intolerant of some others. There is a, a line where you draw where you you don't accept something to happen because you see it as antisocial, as as hurtful, harmful, and and you know. So tolerance doesn't mean permission for everything to exist. It requires a border of what is acceptable and disliked. And that presupposes that there is something that is not acceptable and disliked. So finding what falls into that space for each individual or each group or its political party is really, really important. What What is socially acceptable but disliked and what we will not allow. Um, and what you find is that the more narcissistic the societies or collectively narcissistic groups can be, the lower their tolerance for the voice of the other, the lower their ability to recognize the other. And if you don't recognize the other, the whole concept of tolerance becomes almost an oxymoron, right? That they don't have right to exist, therefore they don't have right at all. So, mm -hmm. so you've already touched on reactionary politics to sort of oppose it to radicalization. Um, but tell us a little bit more about it. What really characterizes reactionary politics? Oh, that's my soft spot. That's my that's my passion these days. So I'm going to talk to you about reactionism a little bit and also about a very difficult term called resentiment or resentment. Well, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll make a distinction between them, but it's, it's good to treat them as separate. Okay. So I started doing research in this area of reactionary politics a few years ago when we were studying actually political radicalization. So it all comes in a sequence um, based on our conversation. When we were trying to understand radicalism in the context of the financial crisis that we had in Europe in the previous decade, and we were trying to make sense of radical political action that is also turning violent or supports illegal uh, means. So um, the desire to to advocate for change or implement change through violence or illegal political action, which is defined as radical um, in essence. And we were looking at these radical political behaviors or desires and what we found is that there was something that was not sitting very well. It wasn't making much sense because their values were not radical in the traditional sense of radical meaning advocating change towards the new, but they were advocating urgent, abrupt change towards the old. So we started looking, this doesn't make sense. This is not radical. What is it? And in a very important book in 1922, a scholar called Wolf made this argument that the counterpoint of radicalization is reactionism. So this is not new to us in a, in a way, um, because this is phenomena that were described by, for 1920. So we're talking about ancient history for many of us, right? But if you read this book, you start recognizing that what we are going through today is not so different to phenomena that people were experiencing a century ago, literally. And so the concept of reactionism from these studies helped us understand a lot what's happening today. And in fact, apply it, borrow it and apply it um, to understand current political practices. So the work on political reactionism looks at it as an orientation that's counter to radicalism, but also similar to radicalism in a way. It, together radicals and reactionaries which mar will march towards change, but the radicals will march this way forward and the reactionaries will march backward. And they're both comfortable with urgent change and adopting violent means. Now, this is good schematically because it helps us understand the motivations, the values that are driving radical versus reactionary political behavior. But it doesn't tell us very much about the psychology behind it in terms of emotion. So we started looking at how, what are the affective reactions of these individuals? How can we understand how they feel? Why, why do they do this? Right? Why are they driven towards backward politics or forward politics, but urgent with an urgent desire for change? And how, how are they feeling in the process? So we found the concept of um, um, resentiment, a very useful concept to understand what's going on. 
what is Resentimide? It sounds pretentious, it sounds a little Frenchy and complicated, but, and, and, but it isn't. It is, a, it, it is a complex term that signifies a, um, a complex emotional condition, or as we say in our studies, a mechanism that changes the way you orient towards politics. It starts from a sad space. It starts from um, bitterness, envy, a sense of grievance, a sense of being unseen, a, frustra a deep frustration of feeling um, that your desires cannot be met, that you are in an impasse, you, you are stuck against a situation that no matter how hard you try, you cannot change it to your benefit. And it comes from this internalized frustration that is really difficult for um, any individual to handle. What do you do with it? What do you do if you feel angry but also unable to implement change? You're stuck and you're left with your frustrations. Psychologically, your system to be able to sustain your sense of self is motivated to do something with it, change it, right? You either kill yourself or you, you go on living, but you have to find a way to manage that that pain. Yeah. So what you do in that process through resentima is transform this negative emotion that involves envy, sometimes it can involve shame or an efficacious anger, into through a, a really difficult and complicated uh, process, almost like we, we describe it in our publications, almost like a corkscrew, where you, you go deeper and deeper into an alternate reality that makes you feel a little better about yourself. And that, by doing this, you trans, tr well, you transvaluate, you change the value, to say it simply, of the things that you want to, to achieve but you couldn't, the things that you wanted to attain that you couldn't, to something that is now undesirable. So this is the, the Aesop's fable of the fox and the sour grapes is a really useful example here. Um, it goes like this, right? The fox is trying, jumping to grab the grapes, the sweet grapes that it can see, but it keeps trying and failing and trying and failing. And it falls, and as it falls, it hurts itself and it keeps trying and failing, so it becomes inevitable. It becomes dealing with this um, inability um, is almost inevitable. The fox has to face it. So what does it do? It doesn't just walk away, it walks away saying, I don't want these grapes, they are not sweet, they are sour. And I am not incompetent for not being able to get them. I am now the victim, the moral victim of, you know, of the situation. So I walk away almost like a winner. I don't have what I want, but if I've been able to change the value of what I want to something I don't want anymore, it's not that big a loss for me. So I have managed it in a very complicated, it's almost like an emotional maneuver, as we say, to change your reality. You change yourself, first of all, from this inefficacious victim to a moral victim. You change what you wanted to something that you don't want anymore. So the good becomes bad, the bad becomes good. Those who have the things that you want are no longer the ones that you admire, that you had on the pedestal, but they fall down because you say, they are not worthy my admiration, I walk away from here now, right? Deep inside, you still want it, but you have repressed it. So there is a really complicated system of emotional defenses that are going on. And as you get deeper and deeper in this mechanism of resentima, as resentima has its grips on you, I don't want to call it as something that is external to you, it's part of our psyche, it's not imposed by anyone else. Um, but as you are in that process, in that mechanism of resentment, you can start engaging with defenses like denial. And these defenses, or splitting. So the word, the world is all good or all bad. The others are all good or all bad. Um, denial of the realities around you. And you start creating a constructed reality that is not very much aligned with the environment. And that compromises your ability to make sense of the world. So, although it makes you a little bit happier because you don't have to deal with the painful world, it puts you in a place where if reality hits the door and you've lost contact with it, you know, 
your responses to reality will not be prosocial, at least. And the other thing that resenting all does is it it turns this negative emotion about the self into a negative emotion to, against others. And these others could be anything. Um, and that's where populist narratives um, that target minorities or target um, scapegoats are very easy um, for individuals who are undergoing this process. They are very palatable for them because they give them the targets. They uh, can easily then um, throw their negative emotions against. So the whole system creates a very antisocial um, space. Um, and in our work, in a recent publication we, we will be um, having out in, in a few weeks, we talk about the antisocial triad of grievance politics. And what happens in that antisocial bundle is resentment as the effective power or the effective mechanism, emotional mechanism, that makes, that works together with this reactionary backward desire for change. So reactionism as um, the value component, uh, resentment as the effective mechanism, and collective narcissism as the outcome by which um, these resentimentful individuals relate to others um, that go through the same process with them, uh, where they praise their in-group and they hate uh, the out-group, but they do this from a place that is not collectively sound. It's very vulnerable because it's based on a very precarious sense of self that is almost a reaction to the grievance rather than um, a solution to the grievance. It doesn't, it, it doesn't give you a solution, it gives you a temporary management, but it's very costly socially because of the way you relate to others. Um, mm -hmm. Very complicated story, I probably didn't do justice to it, but, but we have publications on it. So if somebody, uh, one of any of your uh, listeners want to know a little bit more about it, I think reading the texts would be a little bit more informative than than me trying to explain it here in, in two minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in a bit toward the end of the interview, I will give you the opportunity of uh, linking people to some of the places on the internet where they can find your research. Uh, just out of curiosity, this term resentiment, uh, is it the one coming from Nietzsche, but applied to political psychology, mm -hmm. or is it really another thing completely uh, used by the political psychologists? It is that word that comes from Nietzsche, but not just Nietzsche. So it has, uh, um, it has been explored and examined sociologically from other scholars. Scheller is a, is a big name that wrote extensively on Rizetima following Nietzsche and, and trying to look at the psychology or the psychological content um, of these of, of, of this emotional mechanism, what it contains and how we see this process of transmuting, changing uh, and transvaluating what is desired to the undesirable. The core of that is this victimhood idea that an individual that sees themselves as victim, sometimes because they are real victim, right, um, and because of actual circumstances, change their own perception into a moral victim, retaining that victimhood, um, and then managing to project their grievance outwards um, rather than inwards. It, it has its origins in the Nietzschean resentment, but it has evolved and understood um, a little bit more beyond uh, the way Nietzsche saw it. But some really useful insights come from there too, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I would like to ask you one last question and perhaps we will leave the concrete examples where these topics we've been talking about apply to like for example European integration and immigration debates, Islamic fundamentalism, populism to our next interview if you don't mind. Uh, let's uh, have this first interview as a sort of introduction to then get into the more specific topic. So j just one last question. Uh, in terms of the reactionary radicalization spectrum, let's say, 
does it uh, is it associated with in any way with another way that political psychologists and political scientists use to classify politics that is the sort of uh, conservative progressive spectrum does it have anything to do with that or not yes i think i think I think you you let me see if i can put it in context so mm -hmm. when we think of reactionary and radical orientations, at least in the world of orientations that I'm studying, I'm not going to talk about ideologies because that confuses things a little. Mm -hmm. But if we just stick to orientations that have their origins in values, orientations, how do we see the world, right? Um, based on our values, reactionary and radical sit almost at opposite ends. Um, the reactionaries want to move things back. The radicals want to move things forward urgently, now, right, but at any means. Um, a little bit closer to appreciating the present are uh, their progressive and retrogressive uh, brothers and sisters, as we say. So what's the difference between them? Retrogressives want a move towards the past, but slowly, mm -hmm. uh, and progressives want a move towards an unknown future, slowly. Mm -hmm. So the progressives are comfortable with a level of uncertainty about tomorrow, but not so much, step by step, and not by fully undoing the present. Their relationship with the present is enough, it's, it's, it's a favorable one. They can see the good and the bad in the present and want to change it um, slowly. What's interesting with the radicals and the reactionaries is that they are embedded in what we call splitting. The now is bad, the future is good, all good, and the now is all bad. And for the reactionaries, the now is all bad and the past was all good. So the, this idealization of the past or the idealization of the future are the properties of reactionism and radicalism. They're not properties of anybody else because the others are not splitting. Um, splitting means not being able to see the world as a little bit good and a little bit bad, appreciating the good, um, understanding the bad, and, and always wanting a desire for change, but, you know, um, seeing both sides. Splitting doesn't do both sides. It's either or, that's it. So when, where is conservatism? Again, you could see it as a political ideology and because we have parties called conservatives that can create a lot of confusion. So I'm not going to talk about that, but I'm talking mm -hmm. about it as a conservative orientation. Conservatives block everybody else and say, guys, stop it. We're fine where we are. We got to keep it as it is. So conservatives have a really positive relationship with the present. They don't want change. They want to keep things as they are. They might be able to accommodate a little bit of change, but their main fundamental desire is to keep things as they are, not change them. Uh, whereas the retrogressive want the change. Their main aim is to change. They will tolerate the now, but with a vision that at some point it's going to change slowly. And the progressives, the same. They will tolerate today, but they're living towards they're living in the future, in a sense, the same way that retrogressives are living with one foot in the past. Um, the conservatives are very com comfortable in the now, uh, and, and they, they would be very uncomfortable for change. That's where conservatives and reactionaries have a little bit of a problem when they get together, because the reactionaries really don't appreciate the now. They want to change backwards. So progress. if you have progressives, reactionaries, and retrogressives, in one party, uh, not political party, but a social gathering, you will find that although they find some comfort together in the values of tradition, of security, of appreciating uh, how things are or how things used to be, when you start talking about solutions for moving forward, political change, desire for the vision, their visions um, change, and that's where the radicals, I'm going to put them at the tops of my uh, fingertips, the radicals and the reactionaries attach in connect. So if the conservatives are here in the middle, if you fold it, you try to see that those groups at the extremes have connection points. And the connection points is their desire for uprooting the present. 
Um, and, they, and that's why you see in certain social movements, reactionaries and radicals together fighting for the same cause to overturn the status quo. That doesn't mean they want to go to the same place. They want to go to a very different place. But when it comes to joining forces to overturn the status quo, they're united. They work, they can work together. That's why when we study um, political extremism, when we study pol support for political violence, it is very, very important for us to realize that the means, right, might be very different to the ends. So we are trying to um, look at the psychology of the extremists, of the people that endorse, support, engaging in violence, or support the means of violence more broadly, like that it's okay to do this if you have to. Um, and try to understand, are they coming from a radical space or are they coming from a reactionary space in their mental organization? That makes a difference because that can help us understand where they want to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, And this is one of the big oversights, we think, in radicalization research, this assumption that everybody who engages in violence is a radical extremist. Well, no, they might be a reactionary extremist. And realizing where they want to end up, it's really, really important for us. Their vision, right? Their values. It's really, really important for us because we live with them. We live in that system. So understanding people's desire for change and the direction of that change is crucial for any society. Misunderstanding it causes more grievance and causes more problems. So that's that's where we're at. That's where I think this value, this this work has so much value. It's so important. Mm -hmm. Yes, it very much is. And uh, so just before we go today, uh, I, I want to give you the opportunity then to plug in some of the places where people can find you and your work on the internet. Oh, uh, I don't know. Uh, where Because scholars have uh, Google Scholar and I am on Google Scholar, so putting my name there should be easy and uh, my works are listed there. Um, People who are interested, that are not academics, but are more interested in understanding about this phenomenon, I think they Google the terms and that might not get them somewhere. So I'm wondering whether there is a way we can place some links. Most of my articles are open access. So for your um, listeners, that means people don't have to pay journal fees to access them. They can access them for free. And that will give them an idea of, of um, of the fundamental principles. It's also a good way of sharing knowledge, of becoming more informed, more sophisticated about the nuances of political psychology. Um, where can people get more information about political psychology? I am president of the International Society of Political Psychology, so I have to put that hat on and tell you that if um, any of your listeners, uh, of your audience is passionate about political psychology or even just a little bit curious, we have a wonderful society, that's the International Society of Political Psychology, and our website is www.ispp.org. And that has, it is the mothership of resources for anybody that wants reading in political psychology, training in political psychology. We have a list of academic institutions that offer courses in political psychology list of academics that study and do research on political psychology. So that's that's the first point, I think, for anybody. Um, if you wanted to study with us, you can come to Birmingham and do our political psychology uh, degree. But there's other good places as well that do that. Too. All of them are listed at ISPP. So maybe that's the first place to go to. Um, and of course, listening more to your work, because I'm sure you have other colleagues coming up uh, talking about these very interesting topics. And I hope we have a chance to talk again, because there's so much, so much more to discuss. Yes, I hope so. And I will be leaving links to all of what you mentioned. And thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a real pleasure. And as I said, I will leave uh, an inv a second invitation on the table for us to get into more specific topics like European integration, populism, Islamic fundamentalism, Brexit, and all of those kinds of topics. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ricardo. It has been a treat. Thanks.
Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, hit the subscription button, all of those things you already know. And please consider supporting the show either on PayPal or Patreon. All of the links will be in the description box of the interview starting at $1 per month. So it would be a great help. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimir, Greg Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Vosbo, Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Narcio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Mark Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, George Pinha, Phil Kavana, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Kassan, Ivan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrandt, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W. João Eira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dremiti Grigoriev, Diego Lanonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adan Ruzmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidis, I'm Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortes, Ursula Litzke, Denise Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy and Trader in NYC. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vangnagdam, Curtis Dixon, John Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Giddy, Sardus France, Thomas Trumbull and Nuno Welder. And my executive producers, Michel Rogieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.